today on Mother Mayhem. When everything catches up to you, it isn't uncommon to go through these deep spells of depression and anxiety because like she pointed out, she was never parented emotionally. She never learned how to feel feelings or that her feelings were okay. Welcome back to Mother Mayhem, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Podcast for Daughters. Hi, I'm your host, Heather Gray. And when I think about this episode and what it's about, I don't mind saying it's a little bit all over the place. Today, I want to introduce you to Whitney. I went down a Whitney Houston rabbit hole recently, <laughs> so that's why she's getting the namesake honors for today. When Whitney first reached out, she had already started her narcissistic abuse recovery work, and she already had her therapist support. I was really moved by her story, and I wanted to share it with all of you. And at the time, I wasn't able to cover her question on the show right away. So as a result, I ended up in an email exchange with her. And when I think of her story of starting the work, the question she had, and her journey, I really thought that they were really important to share. While Whitney is a little further along in her recovery by now, I do still want to introduce you to her, allow you to get to know her, and about her strength as well. So I'm going to share our email exchange and also some additional thoughts that I've had since we last connected. Whitney just shares really important information, and it's information I want you to know. And I just, I think it's so much more powerful when it comes from someone who's been walking your path too. So here's what Whitney first had to say. Thank you so much for your podcast and your work in general. You mentioned wanting to receive more questions and stories, and so I was hoping to contact you for some support and advice. For many years, I thought I was doing a great job resisting my mom's cruelty by living the life I wanted despite her protests. After many years, I realized I was focusing so much of my emotional energy and brain space on romance that I chose celibacy and a reset to see how that might change things. What I found is that for most of my life, romance and dating and crushes and sex were a crutch, a coping mechanism. And when I gave them up, I was left with a crushing depression and anxiety spiral. Not all at first. At first, I felt capacious in a way that I hadn't for many, many years. But then with the stress of a move, new job, life post-pandemic, my anxiety and depression whirlwinded out of control. I've never had such a prolonged episode before, nearly two and a half years, and I've never felt such profound and deep self-loathing and self-doubt. The self-critical voices, which are so clearly the internalized messages my mother fed me, ran rampant. They were the ones with the loudspeaker, and I lost faith, hope, energy, and confidence. I've since chosen to take a break from my job and just focus on therapy, embodiment, and self-care for a while. It's been very hard and painful, and also very fruitful. I think for much of my life with my mother, I was in denial about how bad it all was and how much her blame and cruelty impacted me. I had built my walls up so effectively. I thought I was protected, but that shit is poison and it seeps through, I guess. My question now that I'm letting myself grieve a little bit more and feel this more fully is how do I protect myself from the poison that erupts periodically when she can't self-regulate while also still remaining open? How do I heal the internalized self-criticism and also remain in relationship with her? I am the only child of a single parent, so I feel a deep obligation to remain in contact. How do I believe in my own inherent worthiness when she for so long has taught me I'm incapable of love, which I know is wrong, but when I'm unwell, I really struggle to refute. I feel like a big part of the grief is the loneliness of not just being unmothered, 
but also unparented emotionally in general. There were no adults to model real love, a love that listens and encourages and celebrates and supports. I feel like I have big, meaningful friendships where that is the norm, but I sometimes struggle to parent myself because of how much I was taught that parental love is anger and punishment. I'm going to visit my mom soon, and I know there will be at least one blow-up fight, because there always is. What do I do to keep my heart safe? So here's how I responded to Whitney. I was totally in the weeds with emails and letters, and I knew I wasn't going to get back to her on the show, so I offered her this email in response. Thank you so much for reaching out and sharing your support of the show. I'm so glad to know that it's helping you and that you're finding peace with it. I do want to tackle your question for the show, but I have a feeling that your trip to your mom's is likely coming up sooner than the episode will air. I'm scheduling several weeks out at this point, (laughs) jokes on me, it's been months at this point, and have a queue of questions I'm working on. So let me offer some quick, direct feedback. You've been doing trauma work at a level that you're not used to. It is likely going to make you feel like you're walking through the world with all of your nerve endings exposed, like your body has been turned inside out. That is normal and expected, but it also means that this is an incredibly vulnerable time to be with your mom. I wouldn't actually advise it until you felt more secure in your skills for navigating her. I imagine, though, that hearing me say, just don't go, might fill you with enormous anxiety at having to set that boundary with your mom, and you might not be far enough in your recovery to tackle that one. If you can't cancel and feel like you absolutely have to go, can you stay at a hotel? Do you have to be with her 24-7? The best way to armor up at this point is to actually not give her any of your vulnerability. I wouldn't share your feelings with her. I wouldn't talk about your relationship, and I would work to stay in neutral. You can look up the gray rock technique in Google and find examples for how to do this. Someday you may confront her. Someday you may engage, but right now we're protecting you by not giving her any parts of you that she could weaponize. I would definitely head to episode five of the show. That links to a grounding techniques sheet that will help you, and I would focus on doing grounding exercises regularly in anticipation of going and then while you're there. I would make sure you have friends that you can text and connect with and people that will have your back and keep you company. I would make a coping or care plan with your therapist Will your therapist perhaps be available for support? What are the coping strategies you've already gathered and have proven successful for you? Can you cut the length of the trip? We know your mom is narcissistic, so she's going to do what narcissists do and act narcissistically. We're not going to be surprised by this. We're not hoping that she's not going to act narcissistically. We're just going to plan for it, and we're going to work to disengage with her vitriol as much as possible. You're going to get your feelings hurt, of course, because she's acting hurtful. So when she's doing these things and saying these things, instead of internalizing the experience and beating yourself up, picture your younger self. That little girl is hearing all of those things from her own mother. What does she need? What does she need to hear? What does comfort look like for her? What does she need to be able to let go and hurt less? Focus on giving her those things, on allowing yourself to be the parent to your younger self that your mother never was for you. None of this is intended to replace the work of your own therapist. So make sure you're making a support plan with your therapist too. Whitney, she then came back with a response. Dear Heather, thank you so much for this thorough and generous response. 
I am amazed by how much you give your listeners. It's such a beautiful and profound offering. Whitney, I have to tell you that that phrase, profound offering, was saved into my glimmers folder. I always want to be that person. And that was an incredible compliment for me. It meant so much that you could see me. I also hope you know that we, your listeners, want what is best for you too, whether that's a break or anything else. You are amazing whether you give in this way or not. So no pressure at all to respond to this message. So glad you said so, Whitney, because I did in fact take several weeks off. I just listened to your most recent episode and went back to some of your previous episodes, and I feel like in many ways so many of my questions have already been answered. I've actually been in therapy on and off for many years and have tried different modalities. I've also moved a lot, so had opportunities to work with new folks and try new things. And I feel like this August, I've really been able to make a strong list of flexible tools that I can practice, whether that's incorporating parts work, breath work, somatics, or just general reflection. I'm realizing that my two-year depression and anxiety spiral was the result of one, challenging my own defense mechanisms without which I realized how much her critical voice had seeped in, how much I had been impacted by her cruelty all along, and two, attempting a new coping mechanism which did not go well, which was people-pleasing and a lack of emotional boundaries with my students and friends. And the combination did not go well. But in some ways, I think the crash necessitated a reckoning and that one was long time coming. I built myself back up, taking in all that I had learned, but also in a new way that really prioritized listening. I'm realizing how much my work is, one, to widen my window of tolerance by really allowing myself to feel and react before analyzing, assessing, or logicing <laughs> my way through a problem. I think this primary step of feeling and affirming my feelings was one of the big things I was missing. I so often was trying to quote unquote solve my trauma and my relationship with her and my symptoms rather than just making space to feel however I felt without justification or over explanation or an attempt to fix. The tool that's been most helpful is to let myself rant and tantrum and grieve in a document. And notice that as I do that, always another wiser, kinder part shows up who can affirm and speak back to the really emotional part. And two, as I listen to my emotions more, pay attention to their messages, I need to set better boundaries. I don't want to overgive or fixate on other people's problems anymore. I'm learning that through boundaries, I have more capacity to love myself and enjoy my life and also love other people with less resentment. I think both of these things, feeling my feelings and having communicating boundaries based on those feelings, are going to take work and practice, but I feel equipped and ready to try. All of which is to say, I'm going to see my mom but I recognize there's nothing I can do to change her behavior. She's going to be cruel and dysregulated no matter what I do. So my work is to keep self-attuning and taking care of my inner kiddo and protecting her first and foremost, which might mean leaving early or taking walks alone when my mom freaks out or going to a friend's house. I think if I journal every day, the next right action will show up on the page as long as I'm honest with myself about how I feel. Thank you again for all that you do and for all that you're creating. I love the reflection questions you ask in your episodes, and I've been trying to pause and write them down as journal prompts. Thank you again for everything. I'll let you know how the trip goes. While a great deal of resolution can be found in this email chain, I do want to expand a little bit on some of the central themes that Whitney's talking about here. Her experience is so reminiscent of so many of the women I meet in my practice. I think it's really important for all of you listening to see that hope, recovery, and healing are possible and that you can make peace with your experience. It's always going to be there. 
It will always be a thread in your story, but it won't always have the same tremendous power. Your trauma will not always feel like it defines you, and it won't always feel like it's top of mind. Whitney's initial experience of intense anxiety and depression, that one happens a lot, more than we would like. Embarking on a healing journey and learning to sit in your feelings is really hard. When everything catches up to you, it isn't uncommon to go through these deep spells of depression and anxiety because like she pointed out, she was never parented emotionally. She never learned how to feel feelings or that her feelings were okay. So it just happened all at once for her. She got this onslaught of the saddest, maddest, and scariest feelings without a roadmap for dealing with them. All she had was the reverberating internalized messages from her mom. And what a son of a bitch that is, right? Not being able to feel your own feelings, but being trapped in your mom's thoughts. It's just really all so hard for you guys sometimes. Let's, gosh, let's just sit with that for a second. It's, it's really so hard for you guys sometimes. And it does start with noticing and observing your patterns, your behaviors, and your choices. It starts with noticing what's happening in your body and what your body feels like. Whitney has a really good tool she uses of venting in a journal. She gets the crap and the nonsense messages out of her head to quiet the noise, and that's what's letting her hear her own voice. Whitney's story of how relationships were her distraction probably feels a little bit familiar to a lot of you too. Relationships are where so often old traumas show up and play themselves out. It's really common and understandable for a lot of reasons. Here's how I can help you understand it. You were never given permission to have a relationship with yourself, right? That's what we say so many times. Your own thoughts and your own feelings, they weren't valued. From as young as you can remember, your energy was on your mom and on her needs, her reactions, changes in her tone, her posture, etc. And you came to know her moods better than your own moods. So the habit of focusing on someone else becomes familiar to you. It becomes ingrained in you. It's your habit and that starts to feel familiar. The psychobabble term for this is repetition compulsion. You end up being driven to relationships with other people that mimic the one you had with your mom. This is sometimes a conscious or sometimes it can be an unconscious effort to change the ending to the story. Your mom was emotionally unavailable for you, so you might find yourself attracted to emotionally unavailable people either because it's familiar or in this attempt to change the ending to the story. In these moments, you're trying to get that emotionally unavailable person to choose you. You're trying to rewrite your mother's tired narrative of you with someone new, someone different, with their experience of you instead of with your own voice and your own relationship with yourself. Whitney doesn't say so, but I would imagine if she was checking in with us now, she would be telling us that she's experiencing better relationships with others now, that she spent time building her relationship with herself, getting to know herself, and working on her boundaries. And if, like Whitney, you find yourself facing yourself in your trauma for the first time, and you are feeling the weight of depression and anxiety hitting you, I want to encourage you to tend to those thoughts, those feelings, and those experiences first. Your instinct might be to go all in on your trauma, to pull out all of the old hurts, and to do this deep dive exploration. I want to remind you here that one of the reasons you are here and feeling these things is because you were never given the tools or the roadmap for dealing with hard things. 
So even though you might just want to rip off that band-aid and go on some deep excavation, you have got to take it easy. You have to go slow. Don't go digging. Anything that comes up is what you want to notice and pay attention to. You don't want to judge your thoughts, your feelings, or your experiences. Don't shame them. Just notice them. Acknowledge them. Where in your body do you feel them? Where does the tension live? Work on releasing that tension and that stress from your body. It has been years, and it is likely at this point your habit to store it. So you have to go slow. You have to go easy. You have to take your time. Healing from trauma and recovering from anxiety and depression takes time. It's a marathon, and it's not a race. And as you notice and accept yourself, your thoughts, and your feelings, try new ways of coping. Whitney likes venting in a journal. What do you like? I would encourage all of you to explore the role of movement in your emotional recovery. For some of you, that will just mean doing your exercises with intention. But I'm not actually talking about traditional exercise here. Sure, we know that exercise helps with the feel-good hormones and can offer you that respite from anxiety and depression. But when I'm talking about movement, I am talking about ways you can use movement of your body to release pain. Another psychobabble word I can introduce you to here is somatic therapy. So using yoga might be one way. Me, I like going for power walks, and I imagine that with each step, I am releasing something that's painful, something that's on my mind, something that I'm having a hard time holding. When I lived on the East Coast, I loved one of those good old-fashioned dumps of snow because digging out my car and creating that whole me against nature thing was always such a physical release for me. Now I like moving up a hill or slow strength training with really super heavy weights where I can really push and release. Some of you are going to find release by talking with a safe person or through therapy. However, you can come to be more present with yourself and learn more about your own thoughts and your feelings will be the most important. And like I've just walked you through here, learning what helps you cope what gets you regulated, and help you be and feel your most authentic, honest self, that is what's going to be equally important. Tackling anxiety and depression caused by narcissistic trauma is a really big topic. And I'm going to set that one down for now because I want to cover some of the other things that Winnie had to say. Whitney's clearly done her own healing since we first connected, but she asked some really important questions in her email that I do think are still worthy of our attention. One is, how do you stop hearing your mother's voice and abusive messaging in your head? How do you start hearing your own voice instead? The thing that I tell my clients is to look at the source and to question the source. When we hear ourselves in our head, and we're telling ourselves things like we're lazy, we're unlovable, or we're worthless, we want to stop and take stock. Where are those thoughts coming from? Whose voice are we hearing? What's the source? Is it our mother's? Right about now is where most self-help folks are going to tell you to just ignore your mother's voice. It is really great advice in theory, but we can't just tell ourselves to ignore something to make it evaporate. How do we ignore it? We look at your mother. We look at how she raised you, how she treated you. We look at how she talks to you now and how she treats you now. Is her point of view reflective of your own values today? Is the way she's talking to you how you believe we should be talking to other people. How well do you think she actually knows you? Look at the source, my friends. Look at the source. 
if you don't agree with how she looks at the world, if her values are skewed and not reflective of who you are and how you move through the world, you've no business repeating her garbage to yourself. It doesn't belong. You don't agree with her. That is your wise mind right there. Your wise mind not agreeing with her. But by now, at this point in your life, it is your habit to think this way about yourself, to hear her voice instead of your own. How do you kick that habit? You kick it like you kick any habit. I've never been a smoker. I've helped a lot of smokers over the years. Think of smokers. If any of you have ever had to quit smoking or quit something else, you know you had a routine. You smoked a butt when you woke up, mid-morning, lunchtime, mid-afternoon, dinner, mid-evening, and before bed. That was your schedule, right? Or that's what a smoker's schedule is. When you were thinking about not smoking, you were thinking about not smoking every minute between each of those intervals. So you weren't just becoming a non-smoker before you woke up. You were just becoming a non-smoker before lunchtime or at bedtime or wherever you were taking a butt break. You had to think about not being a smoker in every minute between each of those times. That's how we shift the negative tape we're hearing. We don't just turn on a positive tape when a negative tape starts playing. No. We work on keeping a positive tape playing all the time. We try to collect positive thoughts, positive feelings, and experiences to combat our mother's critical ones. Then, when a critical thought does pop up, you answer back to it with actual information you have come to know about yourself, that you believe in about yourself, and that you take pride in. That is why inner child work can be so hard and tricky sometimes, because without a roadmap of what a kid should be told in hard moments, you don't always know what to say to your inner child. But this is how you find out. You get to know yourself, and then you share that with your younger self. Now, Whitney also asked, how does she protect herself from a narcissistic storm given that she's getting ready to see her mom? You already heard at the beginning of the episode some of my initial thoughts that I sent her way, but let me add a few more before I wrap up here, because my goal in all of this is to help you all get in the driver's seat of these kinds of decisions for yourself. You want to be driving yourself to your own destinations. Here's how I want you to think about it. When Whitney first wrote to me, I was urging her to just give herself permission to miss the visit. But she was clear that that wasn't going to work for her. You protect yourselves from narcissistic storms by reminding yourself of who your mother is, not expecting her to be any different, and not sharing anything with her that is in any way vulnerable or fragile. Then when she goes and does the narcissistic thing or says the narcissistic thing, you remind yourselves, right. She made that choice. I expected her to make a choice like that. I am here, not for her, but for me. I consider not seeing her, not visiting her, or not responding to her. But that choice doesn't work for me. It's not reflective of who I want to be right now or how I want to move through the world. So yes, there she goes, but I don't have to go with her. Her truth does not have to be my truth. I don't have to agree with her, and she does not deserve access to my thoughts and my feelings. I am in control of this relationship, not her, me. It can change any time I need it to change. Now, I know that is going to feel like one big old gigantic stretch at first, but eventually, When you start to do that as a habit, you're going to find your way with it, and it will start to feel more and more true, and you'll feel more and more armored up against her criticism. It's 
really hard work, friends. I applaud you for showing up for this conversation and for being in it with me. All of you are in this together, and I for sure am in it with you too. Thank you so much for today. Until next time, bye for now. I'm so grateful that you're here. You're right where you're supposed to be. At its heart, I'm hoping to use this show to build a community of women working together to heal from childhoods marked by maternal narcissism and emotional neglect. My goal for Mother Mayhem is that this show becomes an advice and mentoring-driven show where you share your questions, struggles, and stories, and I offer you direction for healing and recovery. That can't happen without your contributions. I invite you to send a recorded voice memo or write in an email with your questions and things you're struggling with. You can always find me over at heather at daughtersnpd.com. To connect further, I invite you to find me over at Instagram and occasionally on TikTok at Daughters NPD. If you know another woman who needs this conversation in her life, I'm going to ask that you share the show with her. You can help me get the word out with your reviews and social shares of the show, and I hope you'll consider doing so. Special thanks to Heather Clark for editing this show. She's in my head and knows what I meant to say when the words come out backwards. Thanks for your time today. I'm always in it with you. Bye for now.